Okay, this is going to be a video lecture about chapter 11. This is not going to be a professionally edited or narrated lecture because I'm still at home not feeling well and I'm kind of doing this on the fly here. So if something comes up that looks kind of unprofessional or something looks a little bit awkward or the sound isn't perfect, uh, that's why. Okay, so let's begin here with the chapter lecture. All right. So they talk about interpersonal influence. Influence is kind of the theme of the chapter. And that's basically the act of changing another person's attitudes, behaviors, or behaviors. Uh, so basically you're trying to kind of persuade somebody to think differently or act differently about whatever you're talking to them about. Okay, I just took a cough drop, so hopefully my voice won't get too sore. They talk about different types of power here in the chapter. The first one is coercive power, and that's, remember, my perception is my reality, your perception is your reality. It's all about perception. It's our perception or our belief that another person can harm us if they're trying to coerce us into doing something that we don't want to do. And here comes this darn thing again. I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to ignore it. Okay, reward in, pers uh, in a form of interpersonal power that, once again, we use that word perception. Um, that somebody is trying to convince us to do something because there's something positive we can gain from it. We can get something out of it. There's a benefit for us. <clears throat> Legitimate interpersonal power. Basically, uh, if you vote for somebody in an election or somebody is selected to represent you uh, to a larger body, such as the local government, state, municipal government, that sort of thing, they refer to that as legitimate power. Expert power, somebody who's recognized as an expert in their field, uh, somebody who's at the top of their game, one of somebody who's really considered um, uh, an expert in that field, for lack of a better term. And referent power. Uh, and that's the kind of power that people earn through respect and admiration. Um, referent power kind of comes from people who you might uh, have a lot of respect towards, perhaps uh, somebody such as a grandparent, uh, somebody who's been around, somebody who's considered perhaps a wise, uh, a wise person in that field of study or in that realm of life. Okay, so when we talk about persuasion, this is kind of similar to some of the material we cover in public speaking, but basically using messages, spoken messages, to try and influence the attitudes and behaviors of others, very similar to the uh, definition we saw a little earlier on. some different uh, forms of appeals or persuasive appeals or excuse me aspects of persuasive appeals in, uh, can include the quality of the persuasion or the person's reasoning how is the quality of their source credibility in other words where are their sources coming from is is the credibility derived from their personal experience are they getting uh, research material from reliable sources and also an honest emotional appeal these can be very powerful. These, cons these are considered forms of kind of soft, uh, using soft evidence or persuasion uh, in the form of an emotional appeal, but these can also be very effective. Our authors define reasons basically as, here you see on screen, statements that provide a basis for some belief or action. So the reasoning, the rationale, why, uh, y why you should consider changing the way that you think or behave about something. Claims, as you can imagine, basically statements that cl make a claim. They, they claim that this is the best product, or this was the best job I ever had, or um, this is w one of the best restaurants in all of Albuquerque. When we talk about emotional appeals, these um, we, we kind of have two realms. We have like the logical realm appealing to a person's logical processes and then the emotional realm. Uh, emotional appeals can often be a driving force be, behind actions. They can potentially be the factor that convinces a jury of guilt or innocence. Uh, they can convince you of many, many different things um, through television advertising, through conversations with friends, many different settings. Okay, and of course these mes messages are designed to encourage or motivate others to take action, to do something. 
or not do something. And how effective these emotional appeals are depends, of course, upon your mood and the mood or attitude of the other person and how they word their statements. So we talk about ethical persuasion. Ethical persuasion basically says that we're going to tell the truth. We're not going to attack another person. So it's kind of the opposite of what you usually see when you, ha when you watch political campaign ads on television. You're going to show that you care about the other person and, how, and, and the outcome uh, of their decision. So if you encourage them to do something, uh, you're going to care about the outcome and how it impacts them. And you want to share, disclose the overall picture, not just uh, uh, explain a little bit of what's, you know, if you do this, this will be the outcome, and just share one or two bits of information. Try and give them uh, the bigger picture, and so they can see uh, or gain a sense of how things are going to impact them from different perspectives. The assertive approach basically states that you are you're making statements, you're declaring or you're defending your personal rights, such as, for example, the Bill of Rights uh, in the U.S. Constitution. You're making your expectations in clear, direct, and of course, an honest manner, while showing that you respect the rights of the others, the the people whom you're speaking to. You try to focus on benefits or interests um, that will affect both you and the people whom you're speaking to. And note that being assertive always involves taking some sense of risk, just like self-disclosure uh, always involves some level of risk, um, that you might potentially be seen as a little bit on the aggressive side. Let me put this full screen up here. Okay, go back. Okay, so things to keep in mind when using assertive messages are using I statements. I statements take responsibility for your thoughts, your perspective, your perception. Um, try and focus on something that's observable, uh, such as a person's behavior. And then you can, of course, touch upon your feelings as well. So when you focus on another person's behavior, rather than labeling a person, say, in a negative way especially, um, that takes a little bit of the emotional edge off in many cases. So using an I statement, focusing on behavior, I get upset when you do the following or when you did the following, I became upset rather than saying I thought you were a jerk when you did that. Uh, there's a big difference in how the message gets received in most cases to the person you're speaking to. Try and maintain regular eye contact and appear confident in your nonverbal, uh, using your nonverbals. Be firm, but don't sound aggressive in your paralanguage, in your tone of voice. And of course, be sensitive to what we call the face needs. You know, in, when we say that, we mean saving face, uh, not embarrassing the other person, uh, not allowing the other person to look belittled or, you know, uh, have them. Uh, look as though they're of a lesser status than they previously were. Okay, when you make a complaint, um, you begin so by using face work once again, by trying to make sure that you're saving face for both you and the other person. <clears throat> when somebody did something that, that you disagreed with or that, that kind of rubbed you the wrong way, uh, you you want to take the assumption that they didn't mean to do it on purpose and then you describe you know your rights your expectations and how they were violated in other words when they did something that really upset you that kind of crossed a boundary for you and they went beyond the boundary and they did something that from your perspective they should not have done then you can describe how you feel about that when that happens and allow that person uh, to share their perspective uh, or to paraphrase what you just said to make sure that they're clear on where you are coming from. Okay, and then uh, on our, I think this is the last slide here, making a request. Making a complaint, making the request often times use a similar, very similar process, uh, although the message comes across very differently. So once again, when you make a request, assume that your partner is willing to um, make a change. 
also um, be polite but but directly and firmly describe what you want the other person to do once again they use the term do face work uh, make sure you're not uh, embarrassing the other person or embarrassing you especially the other person making them look belittled or less than describe how that other person's behavior violated your expectations crossed how that person's behavior crossed your boundary or one of your boundaries um, you can try and offer an alternative instead of doing what they did offer them another option I, I instead of doing this you could have done that or the next time this happens would you please do the following and then they use the term assume compliance in the textbook assume that they're going to follow what you say the next time something like this happens and then thank them for taking the energy and effort to to listen to what you have to say okay and that's the PowerPoint portion of this activity now I'm going to switch to um, the next segment here so just a moment okay the next section here is I'm going to show you a video from YouTube where they take a look at uh, advertising and persuasion and there's going to be a person narrating here on what type of advertisements uh, were effective and which ones were less effective and then we'll have you break up in small groups in class and try and create your own little TV commercial or infomercial if you will that tries to persuade your audience uh, using material that we just focused on from the chapter now the sound quality of the YouTube video might not be very good because I'm literally gonna put the microphone to the speaker on my computer so it'll pick up the volume so I apologize if the volume sounds really bad or really scratchy or really loud but it's the best that I can do for now at least as far as my technical abilities are concerned so hang on here just a moment Okay, I'm going to play with the volume here just a second. It's time again to review, to review the Super Bowl ads, a thing we do every year here at the Kelly School, a couple days after the game. And a couple things happened this year that we thought uh, probably made some sense to talk about. And number one, those rational ads, the one that lists all of the reasons why you should be buying a particular product, not working so well this year in terms of features, particularly with automotive and some of the other kind of categories. The ones that really were striking, the ones that really were striking the ball hard and doing well were the emotional ads. Um, you also kind of saw um, stories about the values uh, of those brands, the kinds of things that we as, as, as humans uh, really um, prioritize the kinds of things that we've hit the Super Bowl, this is the big American holiday, and so you see Chrysler talking about um, helping one another out and getting through tough times. You see the VW Beetle kind of talking about a universal uh, kind of uh, uh, inclination to uh, slim down and get better and, and be better and be something really new and fresh for the new year. And that and that spot did really well for them. And those tended to be huge. The Chevy ad where we're talking about here's what, we, here's what we're going to get in our graduate for, uh, for graduation, not the fridge, but the, but the Camaro, huge ad, lots of humor in it, and something that really uh, empty nesters and college kids both got a big kick out of. Uh, so the emotional ads really working for the companies this year. Okay, and I'm going to show one more YouTube video here. This one is an infomercial. This one doesn't have so much of an emotional appeal. Uh, although I think it's rather humorous uh, and you'll see how they try and persuade you to purchase their products so just a moment here it's the problem in the marriage bed that no one likes to talk about maybe that's why they call it silent but deadly well now there's a real solution to a very real problem introducing the better marriage blanket on the outside the better marriage blanket looks and feels just like a soft warm comforter but on the inside it contains a layer of activated carbon fabric the same type of fabric used by the military to protect against chemical weapons 
flatulence molecules easily pass through the cotton shell and are harmlessly absorbed into the layer of carbon fabric. Even when used on top of bed sheets, offending molecules are absorbed before anyone knows they're there. So whether you or your spouse suffers from a health issue or just the occasional disagreeable meal, you owe it to your marriage to try the Better Marriage Blanket. It makes a great wedding gift or anniversary gift too. To order, call 1-800-981-1134. Just three easy payments of $39.95. Online at buybettermarriageblanket.com. Order now. Okay, so your assignment is, for the remainder of class, is to break up into small groups of about five members apiece, give or take no more than six members per group, please, um, and discuss the following questions briefly in your group. How do infomercials or commercials try to persuade us? What strategies are they using to try to get us to do something or purchase something? You can ask yourself, have you ever been persuaded to purchase something that was unnecessary, but for some reason you were convinced enough to go out and actually purchase it? Okay, those are just for you to discuss briefly in your small groups. Then, your actual assignment here, don't worry where it has a time limit, disregard that, please. Um, your job is to <clears throat> create a short infomercial, maybe about two minutes long per group, give or take, depending on how much time you have. Um, your goal here is to use strategies, different strategies, for example, that we discussed in the lecture portion of Chapter 11. We talked about rational appeal, we talked about emotional appeal, we talked about being assertive, and those kinds of things. Um, your goal is to try to influence the audience to sell a product to the class so your job is to create your own infomercial it can be based on an existing product or service or it can be based on something totally imaginary that you create uh, out of thin air that you make up and then put it together and have every member of your group participate in the presentation of your infomercial then after every after every group has had a chance to do it or even after each group individually demonstrates it describe what kind of persuasion you used uh, how are you trying to bring in your audience um, tie it into material from chapter 11 you know, rational emotional are you being assertive are you being logical uh, it, and have a brief discussion uh, about that for each groups infomercial Okay, and then you can kind of ask which one was the most convincing, uh, which strategies were the most effective, so which ones were, which strategies were implemented, which ones were more effective. Uh, were there any other strategies that you could have used to try and convince your audience to purchase that product or service? Okay, so that's your assignment. With the time remaining in class, break up into small groups, create an infomercial. Um, decide what kind of e appeal or how you're going to try to persuade your audience put it together and then uh, demonstrate it and then briefly discuss it uh, with the time you have remaining in class good luck and uh, I hope to feel better and I'll see you guys next week <laughs>